Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining me as we continue with our series on creation. And this series is part of our catalog on Campfire Tales. Today's uh, message is called Dark Whispers, and our passage of scripture comes from Genesis 3, 4 through 5. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God bless the reading of his word, the word of God for the people of God. dark whispers. Deceit hissed among the shadows, whispers like a breath of hot air covering the brain with fog and humid mists, a prefabricated, overstated, ill-fated deception seasoned sparingly with a dash of truth, just enough to fling a question mark into the dark, stark, gray matter of the mind. It takes so little to believe a lie and let it satisfy our, ha our hunger for truth. We want to believe what isn't so. Watch the untruth overflow and give us a fill-in-the-blank, clinkety-clank, obnoxiously ranked septic tank of values. It allows us to circumvent and break and bend the facts or the lack thereof. A serpent's hiss with just a kiss of honesty. Shades of gray and heresy make all the fruit appear more pleasant to our senses, undermining our defenses and begging us to steal a taste while laying waste to our welcoming souls, covering our children's eyes to hide the gates of heaven. However, truth be told, grace tastes better than unfettered fruit. It also shines brighter than silver or gold. I'd rather have grace than the kisses and hisses from a servant's face pretending to speak for God. Let God grant me discernment. I don't usually bring phrases and scenarios from Star Wars or Star Trek into my sermons, but sometimes the best examples are lurking there and worth exploring. In this case, I want to talk a little about the, the Kobayashi Maru, an often mentioned scenario in the Star Trek series and movies. Now, I know most of you are probably not Star Trek fans, so I will need to explain a little. The Kobayashi Maru was a training scenario for officers at Starfleet Academy. It involved a no-win scenario which tested how a Starfleet officer might react in an unwinnable situation. The only Starfleet officer to ever beat the Kobayashi Maru was, of course, Captain Kirk. His defeat of the Kobayashi Maru was legendary, making him a hero among Starfleet officers. And while Captain Kirk did many heroic things, it was his defeat of the Kobayashi Maru scenario that brought Kirk the greatest admiration from both Starfleet and the fans of Star Trek. However, here's the thing. The praise that Captain Kirk received became split among the critics and fans alike when they discovered how the well-liked, courageous captain of the Starship Enterprise had accomplished this momentous victory. Well, he won because he cheated the system. The night before he took the test, he rewrote the program in the simulator to allow for him to win. He changed the rules. And since the original program left no room for him to win, he just rewrote the program so that it would allow him to win. Now, some people thought this was ingenious. Others cried foul. Either way, it defeated the reasoning behind the scenario. When faced with an unwinnable dilemma in life, we as humans do not have either the expertise or tools to rewrite the program so that we can win. We quickly come to realize that we, well, we're not God. In such cases, win or lose becomes a test of our character. 
wouldn't it have been convenient to ride out the German army in, no in Normandy on D-Day? Maybe change things so John Kennedy or, or Martin Luther King were never assassinated. Rewrite the program so COVID never happened. Fix the programming so that the doors at Rob's Elementary in Uvalde were locked so that Salvador Ramos was unable to get into the school. If we could know when bad things are going to happen, we could just step in with a few good programmers and fix the problem before anyone gets hurt. When we ponder this scenario as Christians, it gets even more difficult as we realize that God could do just that. Step in before something bad happens and change the programming so that it doesn't happen. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be wonderful if God could just keep us from making mistakes, prevent us from having bad thoughts, remove all of our prejudices, and force everyone to become a Christian and remove the boundaries of denominationalism? He could just like snap his fingers and the entire world would be Christian. Wouldn't that make all of our lives so much better? Well, when we're honest with ourselves, we behave like it's God's responsibility to do that very thing. As a matter of fact, wouldn't it be prudent to go back and rewrite the programming in the Garden of Eden so that either the snake did not show up or that Adam and Eve would be forced to resist the temptation of the fruit from the tree of, the, of knowledge of good and evil? Wouldn't that fix everything? And, and who would know the difference? Somewhere in our insignificant human brains, we feel that we know better than God that we have the answer. God should just fix it so there isn't any more death or pain or hunger or strife or prejudice or hate. A good God would do that, wouldn't he? That is what our brain tells us. Boy, if we could wield the power of God for just a few minutes, we could fix everything. We second guess the way God does things because we think we could do it better. It's relatively simple when we get to the root of it all. We don't believe that God knows what he's doing. God is, is, God is not living up to our expectations. We are a stiff-necked people to believe such a thing. There is no sense of humility when we think that way. We may have never flown a plane before, but hey, we're ready to jump into the cockpit and take over because we don't think the pilot knows what he's doing. We are not and never will be God. But we believe that we can do a better job of running the universe. Now, doesn't that just sound silly when we say that out loud that way? We would have done things differently. As humans, we often armchair our way through life. Doesn't everyone agree that I would make a better president than Joe Biden? I would have done a much better job than Donald Trump. Tom Brady should retire. and Aaron Rodgers should think faster on the field. The Supreme Court is all messed up and doesn't have a clue about what they're doing. What does Elon Musk, Rupert Murdoch, or Richard Branson think they're doing? I'm better... I'm a better actor than Sean Connery ever was, and I sing better than Frank Sinatra. We provide opinions on Kamala Harris, Ivanka Trump, Kim Kardashian, Sarah Palin, and Angela Merkel. It is so easy for us to pass judgment when we aren't the ones in the hot seat, when our lives and careers are not the ones that are on the line the way these leaders are in their fields. Our armchairs are really pretty cushy, and we feel somewhat protected from the public pressure. We can shout at the television and rant and rave on the Internet knowing that no one can really hear us or cares much. I want us to take a minute and take our USB camera and focus it someplace else for a moment. Take it all in. We're, we're looking at the lush green forest of the Garden of Eden. Everything is in harmony. 
Adam is off doing whatever Adam went off to do, and Eve is leaning up against a tree. She doesn't know or care that she is naked. The world around her is innocent. She has a good life going for her. God expects very little from her. She has her husband. She gets to talk with God at times. She lives in a very in very pleasant surroundings. She never experiences hunger. She has no fear. She doesn't even fear death because death is not a part of her language yet. She has no experiences with death. Her life with Adam is extremely uncomplicated. And the rule for continuing to live in this wonderful life, are pre it's pretty simple. Rule one, don't eat the fruit from the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And rule two, when tempted to eat the fruit from the tree in the center of the garden in Eden, return to rule one. You can eat anything else in the garden, plants, trees, berries, fruits, roots, leaves, anything. Just don't eat the fruit from the tree in the center of the garden. Pretty simple. Now, we live in a world where we get upset when the Internet goes down or, or we lose cell service or the electricity is out for a few hours or when politicians are less than truthful with us or when the economy struggles or the shelves at the grocery store are empty or when they cancel our favorite television shows and, and, and so many other things. The only thing that Adam and Eve had to worry about was not eating the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden. But that was just enough of an inconvenience in their otherwise perfect lives that they were susceptible to the greatest lie ever told. Because, let's face it, they really wanted to eat the fruit and they were looking for a loophole in the Eden contract. And they thought they had one. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Just enough truth combined with just enough disinformation to make the lie palatable and easy to swallow. You won't die. After all, you don't even know what death is, but, but look at the benefits. If you eat the fruit, you will know good from evil and you will be like God. And if you were like God, well, why would you fear death anyway? On the other hand, if, if you don't eat it, you will never know. You, you don't want to live to regret it, do you? This makes sense to Eve, and, and the fruit looks so very enticing. In that moment, there were only three things in her mind, herself, the serpent, and the fruit. She wasn't thinking about God. She wasn't thinking about Adam. She probably wasn't even thinking about the tree. Because of the argument put forth by the serpent, she no longer saw a downside to eating the delicious ripe fruit in front of her. She might even have been grateful to the serpent for showing her the out that she had been looking for. She's really so very pleased with herself, and the fact that she didn't die just encourages her to offer some to Adam, who also eats it. But there always comes a time of reckoning when a lie is exposed for what it is. Adam and Eve know what they have done, and they try to hide it from God. There we go again, thinking we can do the impossible. Why do we think that we can hide from God? He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows exactly where we are at any given moment. And try as we might, we will never be able to hide from God, so it's foolish to even try. And now that sin has entered the world. We see the true nature of sin as the lie continues to grow, sprouting arms and legs of blame and misdirection rather than responsibility. Adam blames Eve with a hint that 
it might even be God's fault. The woman you put here with me, well, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. According to Adam, it's Eve's fault because she offered him the fruit. But it's also God's fault for bringing Eve into Adam's life to begin with. If you hadn't forced this, this, this woman on me, none of this would have happened. Adam may feel a bit guilty, but he doesn't feel that he's culpable. And Eve not wanting to be the one left holding the bag, blames the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. If that stupid serpent hadn't been there, and if it hadn't lied to me and tempted me, I wouldn't have eaten the fruit, and everything would be just fine. It's all the serpent's fault. And it might even be your fault, God, for even making such a vile creature to begin with. Very first cases of deflection. Adam and Eve did not want the spotlight to shine on them, so they tried to shine it elsewhere. There's no humility here. There's no, there's no remorse. But before we go picking on these two, I want us to think about the fact that... Uh, before this, there had never been anything to be sorry for. No reason to show remorse. This was a brand new experience. This, this concept of guilt was something new. God had never taught them how to handle this since there was only one rule. What does one do when they break the one rule? What does one do when they realize that no one has ever broken a rule before. God finds all three parties culpable. The serpent for the dark whispers in Eve's ear, Eve for believing and sharing the whispers, and Adam for listening and giving in to the whispers even when he knew he shouldn't. Everyone gets punished, including all the generations of humankind to come after them. What may seem to us to be an insignificant sin compared to the ones that we ourselves have committed was actually the linchpin that held the future of humanity together. Out of that one simple insignificant sin, all sin emerged, condemning Adam, Eve, and their children to always be slaves of their sin. Hey, I have some good news. God knew all of this was going to happen. He knew the nature of his creation. He knew that the fall was inevitable. And in his grace and his great love for his creation, he provided a solution. God reached out and presented a blueprint of fatherhood to all humankind. And God put a plan into action for the redemption of humankind, a plan of growth, sacrifice, and ultimately the gift of his son to die on the cross to remove the stain of sin from his children. He made a way where there was no way. That love started in the Garden of Eden. After the punishments had been handed out, God makes clothes for his children and continues to care for them. In verse 21 we read, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Not God taught Adam and Eve how to do that. God physically made clothes for them. Now that's love. He could have just said, I've had it with you. I'll never take you back. Get out of my garden and try to make it on your own. I'm, I'm not going to help you. But he didn't. And even after he had to remove them from the Garden of Eden, God continues to watch over them and care for them. He continues to care for them up until this day. And he's reaching out to us through his Son and the Holy Spirit to guide us to hold us accountable, and to provide for us. 
A serpent still whispers dark thoughts into our ears, but the Holy Spirit reveals the lies and helps us to avoid them. But we have to choose that path. We have to accept the help. God will not force the truth on us. When we call upon him, he will help us to make the right decision with regards to the path that he wants us on. This week, I pray that we look for guidance in all that we do. We are surrounded by a cacophony of lies and disinformation. Let us allow God to speak into us as a father does, to reveal truth to us so that we can remain the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world and see the world as Jesus sees it. We need to show compassion, mercy, and grace, just as God shows compassion, mercy, and grace to us. God bless you all. Amen.